Our next speaker is Dr. Roger Garrison from Auburn University. His lecture this morning is on the Austrian theory of the trade cycle or the business cycle. Roger. Okay, thank you. Uh, I call this, in, in this show, I call it capital-based macroeconomics. I find that uh, to general audiences, that's uh, less confusing. But hey, for this crowd, it's Austrian macroeconomics. That's what we mean, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> for the general audience, I, I get tired of uh, suggestions that it applies only to the country of Austria. No, not true. And I've had more than one inquiry about this Australian economics that you have. <laughs> no, 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 it's Austrian, it's Austrian, okay. Uh, let me give you a little roadmap of what we're gonna do uh, this morning. Uh, put capital-based macro in perspective and my particular uh, rendition of it in particular. Uh, there are several uh, elements that I'll present, most of which are off the shelf elements. I've taken from standard uh, textbooks. Uh, the one that uh, is unique to the Austrian theory uh, is the structure of production, which is in fact what gives rise to the name capital-based Austrian economics. It focuses on capital and uh, intertemporal allocation of resources and misallocation of resources in the case of uh, business cycles. That's what gives uh, the theory its flavor. But uh, I can also integrate these ideas with several off-the-shelf uh, graphs, one being the, the structure of production, I mean, uh, the production possibilities frontier, which just shows that uh, scarcity is with us and uh, there are trade-offs to be made, uh, particularly the trade-off between consumption goods and investment goods, consumption goods and capital goods, okay? Uh, the loanable funds market, uh, which used to be a staple in uh, macroeconomic theorizing, uh, it was dominant uh, before Keynes. In fact, Keynes is credited, if, you, if we can use that word, uh, to rejecting uh, the loanable funds uh, theory. Uh, and loanable funds is simply the application of supply and demand to the loan market. There's a supply of funds and a demand for funds. Uh, and I integrate that in with the model. Uh, and then I have uh, some stage-specific labor markets, which differentiates the Austrians from the Keynesians, and that Keynes always talks about the labor market, as if it's homogeneous, all labor markets are the same uh, as far as macroeconomic theorizing is concerned. Not so, uh, it depends on which stage in the structure of production uh, the workers are employed and markets in different stages behave differently. That has to get emphasized in the Austrian theory. And then uh, beyond that, uh, I have some applications that some in the back may not be able to see, but I'll read them to you. Uh, and really just two, and it turns out uh, the first one is a demonstration of what sustainable growth looks like in a market economy. In other words, an economy working right. Uh, an economy at work for you and for me. Uh, it gives us sustainable growth. Uh, and then secondly, we look at uh, unsustainable growth, which is the essence of the business cycle. A boom phase of the business cycle is simply a period of rapid growth, too rapid uh, to be sustained. Uh, as we'll see, uh, once we get through the first application to show you how markets work or could work if uh, in interest rates weren't being manipulated, uh, we'll take up the bulk of the lecture, uh, uh, leaving uh, the rest of it, the actual business cycle, uh, as a, a, a corollary, but a pretty obvious corollary, it turns out. So if you understand how markets can work, then you'll understand pretty quickly uh, how they go wrong uh, if uh, the interest rate is being uh, manipulated. Uh, I can show you very briefly, and you've heard it before from Guido Hulsman and others, uh, that this theory has its origins uh, with uh, Ludwig von Mises. Although Mises himself didn't think of it as particularly original, he was simply drawing ideas from the Swedish school, Ludwig Sell, from uh, some British uh, banking theory. 
and from the Austrian uh, capital theory, uh, von Bavarik in particular. Uh, he introduced it uh, in his 1912 book, Theory of Money and Credit, but very briefly in, uh, in, the, in the final pages of uh, his book, uh, he just had a few pages outlining what the theory uh, of the business cycle is. It was Friedrich Hayek who uh, elaborated and uh, de defended the theories in the late 20s and throughout the 30s. Uh, and Hayek, of course, is the one who introduced the uh, Hayekian triangle, which is a depiction of the structure of production. We'll put that to work for us uh, this morning. Uh, I want to uh, show you one methodological point that sort of uh, proves itself just in the stating. Uh, I'm paraphrasing uh, Hayek here, but he says, before we can ever ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. And it seems pretty obvious. If you want to figure out what's, what's wrong with the market, why are we in a recession, or why do we have a collapse, you better first understand how it might have worked had it not been for all of the intervention that was uh, taking place. Uh, and this methodological maxim is observed only by the Austrians. Uh, other macroeconomic theories uh, just observe it in the breach, as they say. They don't, uh, they don't address the issue. We can almost excuse Keynes for not addressing the issue because he believed in his bones that markets don't work. And, and in fact, that's why he ushered in all of his policy prescriptions of the general theory to, to make market, markets work in ways that they couldn't possibly work otherwise. So uh, Hayek takes this uh, methodological maxim seriously. So that's why we start out showing how markets can work. Then it's easy to see what happens when things go wrong. I'll start out with that production possibilities frontier. And uh, this is uh, a little uh, diagram that you see in most every uh, introductory textbook. Uh, it shows alternative ways of allocating resources. You can allocate resources to current consumables or allocate resources to investment goods, which of course will produce consumables in the future. Uh, that's the nature of the trade-off. And uh, for those of you who've had uh, courses in macroeconomics, and I suspect uh, most of you, it might look kind of strange to put consumption on one axis and an investment on the other axis, because in the Keynesian system, those two things are lumped together and put on the same axis, C plus I. And so you don't get the notion of a trade-off between them. You get the idea that there's simply two ways of spending money, the important thing being spending money, okay? Uh, <laughs> the Austrians argue differently. And we make a choice between consumption goods in the present and investment for the future. Uh, I say here under favorable conditions, and that's just the market that's allowed to work with no uh, intervention. Uh, the economy will find itself on that production possibilities frontier. Uh, and that frontier is defined in the textbooks and elsewhere uh, as sustainable levels of output of consumer goods and investment goods, which implies that there can be unsustainable levels uh, just beyond the frontier. So we don't preclude pushing beyond the frontier, at least a little ways, but into a combination that's unsustainable. It's a boom that's headed for a bust, okay? Um, and here I'm just uh, indicating that you see this curve in every textbook, but it's, it's never integrated with the macroeconomic theory. It's about comparing one economy, say Japan, with another in the United States, or <clears throat> it's to show growth theory. Uh, <laughs> but never in business cycle theory, never in macroeconomics. So the Austrians are unique in this sense in bringing in the PPF as part of the story. Uh, featuring the trade-off uh, helps emphasize the difference between the Austrians and the Keynesians, as I've already indicated. We don't add the two components of spending. We contrast the two ways of allocating uh, resources. Uh, 
investment, that, that's simply an annual addition to the capital structure. Uh, and here we're tracking gross investment. Uh, show you that on the horizontal axis there. Uh, a good part of which is replacement capital. It's making good on depreciation, or making good on obsolescence, or making good on just wearing out of machinery and so on. Uh, and in, in a well-developed economy such as the US, a good portion of the capital investment each year just keeps us even. It just keeps the economy from shrinking. Uh, but typically, replacement capital is something less than total uh, investment. Replacement capital is a large percentage, but not the whole thing. And the difference is, uh, is net investment. And that's simply net additions to the structure of the economy in different stages of production, right? Now, uh, with that net investment, that means that the trade-off next year uh, will be a better trade-off. The, the, the production possibility frontier will shift outwards from period to period uh, if in each period is ex experiencing some net investment, right? Uh, that kind of shifting outwards, that kind of investment uh, is perfectly sustainable. Uh, we've got more investment, more, more capital goods. We can produce more consumer goods. So it gives you sustainable growth. Right. So here I say, watch it shift outwards. Now you can hear it shift outwards. <laughs> <laughs> shift out four periods, perfectly sustainable growth. We have got more capital to produce more goods and uh, give, bring about more saving, more capital and so on. Uh, the economy is simply growing. Uh, four periods of growth here. Uh, the actual rate will depend on lots of factors. I've enlisted uh, a couple, and that is when the economy is expanding, uh, the amount needed for replacement also uh, increases. And as the economy is expanding, people are wealthier, they earn more income, and they may save, they may change their saving behavior. They, in fact, historically, they tend to save more. So. Uh, once an economy starts growing in a healthy way, uh, it keeps growing and, and grows even faster as people get more wealthy and they, and they save more. Uh, again, uh, healthy growth. Importantly, it says, if there's a change in saving preferences, say during the current period, uh, that provokes movement along the production possibilities frontier. That's what we mean by a change in preferences. People may choose to consume less now and save instead in order to enjoy more consumption in the future. And that saving can finance uh, investment. Um, suppose people become more thrifty, more future oriented, so they reduce their consumption and save instead. Now, it says watch the movement along the frontier. And what you have to realize here, to really get the, get the comparison straight, this is a movement that is absolutely disallowed in Keynesian theory. It just doesn't happen, all right? Just doesn't happen, which seems ironic. This is a production possibilities frontier. It ought to be possible to move along the frontier, okay? <laughs> if it's not, we're in trouble. Well, let's watch it where it goes, okay? So uh, you can move along the production possibilities frontier. Good for us. And uh, what that means, of course, is now we're starting our growth from a higher level of investment that's made possible by a higher level of saving. Uh, what do you expect the result would be? Well, now watch the economy grow, so it grows faster, okay? It grows faster, shifts out a greater distance from one period uh, to the next. Uh, there you have it. In fact, we can even compare uh, the two economies. Uh, one that didn't have the uh, increase in saving, the other one did, okay? So the difference then is that, uh, is that savings. We note uh, that without that initial saving, and look at the left-hand graph, uh, we get growth, okay? There's the growth. 
But if you save, if you save in the present, or go some consumption, yeah, yeah, consumption goes down. That's what we mean. You're foregoing consumption, but you get faster growth. There it goes. All right, more growth, and you can see after just four periods in this illustration, uh, you're able to consume more than you would have had you not initially saved. Now, I don't want to sound like your parents, you know, telling you you should save. Although some of you probably should, okay? That's not the point. Uh, the point is that, that the rate of growth is determined by how much you're willing to save, apart from technological considerations, resource availabilities, and that sort of thing. But uh, given those uh, parameters, then, then saving gets you growth. If you don't save much, you don't get growth, all right? Uh, and so I just want to point out the relationship between those two. Uh, make your own choices, save a little, just don't expect much growth. Okay, save a lot and you can count on uh, some growth. That's, that's the message. Now here, I apologize if not everybody can see this uh, lower graph here. Uh, loanable funds theory, it's, it was a staple before the Keynesian revolution. Uh, and the graph I've got, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the amount saved and amount borrowed, but in a macro context. Uh, so it's the amount that we as income earners slash savers are willing to save and make available to the investment community, which are the ones borrowing uh, to undertake investments of one sort or another. It's just a supply and demand curve. Saving constitutes your willingness to save. The more interest you're paid, the more you're willing to save. Not surprising. Uh, the demand, uh, that's the investment community's willingness to borrow. And of course, for them, the lower the interest rate, uh, the more they're willing to borrow. Uh, not surprisingly, if the market is at work here, just like Alfred Marshall said it is, in other words, supply and demand, uh, we get a market clearing rate of interest. We get an interest rate that's telling the truth about who's willing to save and how much borrowing is, is demanded. All right, so this is, a, again, the market at work for you and for me, supply and demand for uh, loanable funds. Um, it's interesting that uh, most economists at the time that Keynes was writing understood fully well how this loanable funds market worked and what it meant. Uh, and, and this might be the one and only time that I can uh, cite both Bon Bavarek and Maynard Keynes making the same point, <laughs> okay? Good for them. Uh, but if we conceive the interest rate in a very broad sense, which is just the terms of intertemporal transactions, very broadly conceived interest rates, uh, we should realize that, that, that what is being transacted here is investable resources. In other words, you go to work, you produce things, you get paid for it, it's called income. You spend part of your income on things you and others produced, and the rest you save. Well, the saving gets borrowed by the investment community with which they take command of the unconsumed resources. Those are the investable resources. Uh, that uh, they can pad the productive capacity of the economy and, and make the economy grow. Okay, that's what it's all about. And so that uh, horizontal distance, I've marked it off down there, is investable resources. It's, it's that investment that you've already seen in the production possibilities frontier. In other words, it's, it's movements in the interest rate that will show you how much investment is, will be undertaken in the economy uh, after the consumption has been decided upon by people earning the income, okay? That's the way it works. Now, here's another difference between the Austrians and the Keynesians. Uh, I'm just pointing out here that it's probably more closely identified with Dennis Robertson, who was a British economist. Um, and a friend of Keynes until, until Robertson gave him some pretty critical feedback on his 1930 book, 
After that, he didn't, wasn't allowed to see the manuscripts, as I understand it. Uh, there's Dennis Robertson. Uh, when Roy Herod read Cain's book, couldn't believe his eyes. It looked like Cain's was discarding the application of supply and demand to loanable funds, the loanable funds theory of interest. Uh, and essentially, he told Maynard, he said, if, he said, are you throwing out the loanable funds theory? And Maynard said, yes, that's, you know, that's got to go. And Herod says, well, if you are, you better make that clear. Your readers won't believe you. And so this is the one diagram that you see on the board in a particular application, which turns out to be significant too. This is the one and only diagram in the whole general theory. Can you believe that? You'd think the general theory would be full of macro diagrams. It's not. There's none in there except one. And this is it. And Keynes put it in only to emphasize that he's throwing it out. Yeah, that, was, that was the whole thing. See this? You know, there it goes. No loanable funds theory. The interest rate, he said, early in his book, are determined by forces of a different kind. But the reader has to wait till about the middle of the book before he finds out what kind of forces those are. It turns out psychological forces having to do with fetish of liquidity and all that, okay? All right. Now, we get a, a, still another difference between uh, Austrians and Keynesians. Uh, here we have people becoming more future oriented. They increase their savings, which caused the interest rate to fall, of course. Uh, Keynes denied that people would just decide to save more. You know, I feel almost apologetic about claiming that people might save more. Of course, you can think of all sorts of reasons they might change their saving preferences because they don't think Social Security will be there for them, for instance, or they expect to do a lot of traveling when they retire, or they know how costly retirement centers are. Okay, lots of reasons to save. Uh, and uh, if they save, then of course, that's represented by a rightward shift of the supply of savings curve. Just watch the curve shift rightward. Okay, the curve can shift rightward. Keynes would simply deny it could shift rightwards or leftwards. It's determined exclusively by income. You've learned how to write the saving equation in Keynesian theory. It doesn't have interest rate in it. It's just got income uh, in it, all right? And of course, when that happens, the interest rate falls and people, amount saved goes up. Well, guess what? That fall in the interest rate is precisely what induces investors to borrow more. In other words, to borrow the increased savings. That's the market at work. Uh, for you and for me. That's what gives you the growth of the economy. Now, what I'm showing you is both of those diagrams, they, they link up with one another because I've got investable resources on the bottom and then uh, upstairs is investment, okay, which is the, same, is the same thing. So I'm showing you how the loanable funds market links to the production possibilities frontier. Uh, and this simply indicates that we're showing two views of the same uh, as the same, of the same thing. Okay. Now what we're going to do is just show you those two moves at once that I showed you separately. What you have to do is so you turn your head sideways so you can one eye you can watch the top one and the other one the bottom one. Uh, as before, we let people become more future oriented. They save more, which transmits a signal that is a lower interest rate to the business community. Uh, so watch the saving induced decrease in interest rate and the corresponding movement along the PPF. Are you ready? We'll do it twice. Here it goes. Okay. So saving shifts right. The economy moves along the PPF as investors induced by the lower interest rate, borrow more and undertake uh, investment projects. Okay, it goes like that. All right. Uh, and that's what that says down there. You can't read it from the back anyhow. Now, this is significant. 
Even the possibility that the market economy could work this way is at odds with Keynesian theory, right? And we see why, because what we've got is consumption going down. Well, yeah, you're saving more, but investment going up. And Keynes thought that was just ludicrous that anyone could think that, uh, that that could happen. In fact, he had an alternative sequence. I'll explain it to you. You don't need to read that because I'll explain it to you. He says, no, if consumption were to go down, he says, thank heavens it doesn't. But if consumption were to fall, then there would be surpluses of inventories on shelves. Uh, uh, people couldn't sell what they're already being produced. Why would anybody want to produce more? If anything, they would produce less. And so if consumption goes down, guess what? Investment goes down too. You don't move along the frontier, you move inside the frontier. Uh, and uh, this, at the very bottom, only the first two rows can see that one. This is what Keynes called the paradox of thrift. That's, that's emphasized in the general theory uh, with the uh, other claim that you don't have to worry about it because people don't just all of a sudden decide to save more, okay? Uh, so we have uh, Keynes's paradox of thrift contrasting with uh, the market at work for you and for me, as I've got on the screen now. All right, now let's explain, and this is a big Austrian uh, contribution, let's explain how it is or how it might be, could possibly be, that investors would invest more even if, or maybe especially that, consumers are consuming less in the current period. Uh, and we can recognize that uh, Keynes's examples, if we took those as totally generalizable, then Keynes would be right. In other words, if you look at retail sale, sales, okay, uh, if, you, if you look at stuff you buy at Walmart, you go into Walmart or you go into Riches or wherever you shop, you go into Walmart and, and you buy goods, but then you decide later on you're going to save more, so you don't buy the goods, okay? And they're sitting there on the shelves. Well, that means that Walmart needs fewer stock boys to put up goods. It means they don't want to hire trucking to ship more goods there. It means that the people that are making those goods don't produce as much. It just seems like everything's going to pot. You just have a spiraling downwards into a recession. But it turns out that... Uh, if you look at capital goods, and especially higher order capital goods, which means time consuming uh, production processes, early stage production, uh, you see that you get a different result. Because there are two effects here. One is that sales of final output is down because people are saving more. But the other effect is the interest rate is lower. And so borrowing costs are lower uh, and, and people can begin investing in long-term projects and have them ready for market at the time that people are willing to spend their saved up funds, right? In fact, you know, people don't save for fun. It's not fun, you know, you know that. They save in order to be able to buy more in the future. And it, uh, it takes some entrepreneurs to figure out just what to produce to be able to sell in the future. Okay. Now, to keep track of this, that's where we need this structure of production. And that's the next element here. Capital-based macro disaggregates capital into a sequence of stages. Hayek did it using a Hayekian triangle where you have a number of stages with the output of one stage feeding in as input to the next stage. Uh, Temporally defined stages are arrayed graphically from left to right, in my presentation at least, with the output of the final stage constituting the consumable output. So uh, let's look at, uh, this is the structure of production. It's a triangle, and the reason it's a triangle is because you start small. I mean, you're, you're, you're back in the beginning, you're breaking ground, okay? Uh, or you're uh, looking for, uh, resources, mineral deposits, or you're engaged in some uh, research and development or something like that. It hasn't matured into anything that a consumer wants to buy. 
but uh, eventually that gets the output of that activity gets sold into a, the next stage, which develops it further, and then the next stage and the next stage. And by the time it gets to the consumer goods stage, uh, it's, it's got the full value of the consumer goods as gauged by a consumer's willingness to, to buy it, okay? Uh, now, early stage production could be something like uh, product development, okay? There's a guy, it looks like he knows what he's doing. It's gonna be a long time before that becomes a marketable output, and he has to carry the project on borrowed money until he can sell it. Well, if interest rates are low, then he's more likely to engage in this research and development. Let's look at a late stage. There it is, uh, stocking at retail. That's what uh, Keynes had in mind. That was the example he used. That guy pretty much got it knocked, okay? He's got everything stocked up. He needs some customers, but I assume they'll show up, all right? So that's what we mean by early stage and late stage. Early stage could be exploration for minerals, uh, it could be mining operations, product development, something like that. Late stage retail inventories, all right? Using five stages of production is simply a matter of pedagogy. There are lots of stages of production, but we can use five in order to illustrate uh, the principle. Uh, and uh, we can even show uh, the goods in process moving through the stages of production. You see, this, this triangle is a way of putting the time element into the supply side of the market. I mean, it takes time to produce. It doesn't take time to demand. If you got the money in demand, okay. It takes time to produce. This is something that Murray Rothbard uh, emphasizes in his own writings. Um, and the time it, it takes is the time it takes goods to move through the stages of production. Uh, there we go, okay. Moving through the stages of production. Uh, this isn't an old idea, or this isn't a new idea. It comes from Hayek, 1931. And I note here that that was back when Henry Ford was still producing the Model A, okay? And Ford himself, if you've read any, read any Ford history, uh, he did some mining exploration too. I mean, he was, he was operating at virtually every stage. So his, his operation is a good sort of a micro illustration. And so we ought to get this thing to be able to produce some Model A's or something. Let's see if we can do it. There they are. The 31 Model A Roadsters. Okay. Just puts it in historical context, you know. That's where the triangle came from. All right. So here we have the sequence. Uh, and we recognize that that consumption output is the same consumption that's measured on our production possibilities frontier. Uh, in, in a growing economy, uh, what we'd expect to see is just ongoing growth based on savings each year. And so the PPF and the triangle are both growing. Triangle's not changing in shape, it's just changing in size uh, as the economy grows, okay? But importantly, again, a, a, an Austrian insight here, uh, when people save more, when they decide to increase their saving, it changes the shape of the triangle. Um, when people choose to save more, they send two seemingly conflicting signals. And one is the decreased consumption that Keynes thought was just dominant. Nothing else needs to be considered. That dampens demand for investment goods that are in close temporal proximity to consumption. Keynes would say it just dampens it all the way down. Uh, but the second signal is reduced interest rates, which lowers borrowing costs, makes it more profitable to undertake relatively long-term projects, which have a big component of uh, interest rate costs in them, right? Uh, so it turns out that uh, they're in conflict only if you're treating investment 
holistically, only if you're looking at uh, investment as just I in C plus I plus G like you learned in school. Uh, if, uh, if investment is disaggregated into these stages of production, uh, then you can have increases in some stages and decreases in others, all right? And that's precisely what happens here. Uh, this, is, this is just repeating for emphasis, but it says, watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. What do you think is going to happen? Well, resources are going to be allocated away from the consumption end of that triangle, where demand is down, and used in the early stages to take advantage of the low interest rate, the higher profitability that that makes possible. And so let's watch. And there it goes, okay? So you get an allocation of resources uh, away from current consumption and towards long-term projects that make possible greater future consumption. That's the idea of economic growth anyhow. All this is consistent with what you knew from your parents about uh, saving and uh, pattern of consumption. Uh, once again, I can link it up with the production possibilities frontier and show uh, the two things go together. In other words, um, here it says, watch the economy respond to an increase in savings. So we're moving along the production possibilities frontier and at the same time, uh, reallocating resources within the capital structure. Here it goes, like so. So what we see that savings gives you not only more investment, okay, that showed on the PPF, but a different pattern of investment. It's, it's heavier on the long-term stuff, okay? And so the Hayekian Triangle gives you that differential shift, okay, shorter uh, stages uh, close to consumption and taller stages uh, for the long-term projects. Again, the market at work for you and for me. Now we watch the economy grow again a little more rapidly. And you can see, I'll do this for a purpose here. Uh, I've got a graph down here. I hope, I hope some of you can see it. What, what I'm going to do is plot down here consumption over time. Okay, I've got consumption on the vertical axis and just time on the horizontal axis. And what I want to emphasize here uh, is that if you track consumption on either of the two top diagrams, you see first consumption falls and then it rises. Look at it on the PPF. It falls and it rises. If you look at it on the structure of production, you can see the old structure there. And then the new structure that grows more rapidly, you see it falls and it rises, okay? So if we plot it on this graph below, we can show consumption falls when they save and then rises more rapidly uh, as, the, as the economy grows, all right? Uh, eventually, exceeding the growth path that would have existed uh, had we not had the savings. And so what this illustrates is that this is how the market economy provides an intertemporal trade-off. In other words, you're trading off all the consumption you could have had currently and in the near future, and you're gaining uh, consumption in the more remote future, but a lot more consumption. That's the whole idea of saving uh, to be able to consume more in the future. Okay. You know, pick up the pace here so I don't run out of time. Uh, labor specific, I'm sorry, stage specific labor markets. Uh, it turns out that because of that interest rate effect and the way that resources get allocated, labor has to get uh, allocated in, in a similar way. And so now instead of showing you the pictures of, of the uh, research and development worker, and uh, the retail stocker worker, uh, we can just use supply and demand diagrams uh, for labor markets, all right? And the point being here is that those markets behave differently depending on what stages they're hooked to. Unlike Keynes, who talks about the labor market as if they're all the same. 
uh, an increased saving has differential effects on the demand for labor in the early and late stages. And you can see what they are. At, in the late stages, you'll have a decrease in the demand for labor. You don't need as many of stock boys or stock girls in Walmart as you did before. But just as surely, an increase in the demand for labor in the early stages. Uh, so here we're gonna watch the economy respond to an increase in saving and look at the labor markets. You'll see a decrease in demand for late stage and an increase in demand for early stage. That's what moves labor out of those late stages and into the early stages. Hayek in his uh, prices and production actually identified what he called a wage rate gradient. In other words, I'm drawing in here just to show you that wages are relatively low in late stages, relatively high in early stages as the economy is adjusting uh, to the increased saving. Okay. Well, we can put this all together now. We've got the loanable funds market down here, and we've got production possibilities up there, uh, Hayek and Triangle down there in the labor markets. Uh, and so now we've achieved what Hayek set out or specified we needed to. How does the market work to allocate resources over time? Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. You see it all at once, here it goes. It's consistent with the principles all the way around as, as we presented them individually. I'll do it once more. Okay, more savings, shifts along the curve, reallocate resources, labor markets move workers to the early stages. Okay, uh, this does get some recognition even in the mainstream media. Um, Steve Hankey writes for Forbes, and look what he writes. He says, with interest rates artificially low, see we haven't had any of that yet in, in my presentation, consumers reduce saving in favor of consumption. Why, why save if you can't get uh, much interest? And entrepreneurs increase the rate of investment spending. And then you have an imbalance between saving and investment. You have an economy on an unsustainable growth path. This, in a nutshell, is the lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 1920s. So what he's showing is how manipulating the interest rate causes the market to deviate from what it would otherwise be doing, namely tailoring production plans to your own saving preferences. I'm going to skip... Uh, something by Hayek, just to save a little time here. So here now I've got the, the loanable funds market on the board again, uh, but now I'm, I'm changing the game. Uh, I've got credit expansion. I've got a central bank that has control of that supply of loanable funds. It doesn't have control of saving. It can't increase saving, but it can pad the savings with money created for the purpose, okay? So instead of shifting uh, the saving function, it simply pads it with money created for the purpose. I think I say that here. So in other words, supply of loanable funds shifts rightward, but there's no increase in saving. The money is just masquerading as saving. So watch the opposing movements of saving and investment as a central bank adds money, delta M, changing the money supply, to the, to the uh, supply side of loanable funds market. And just to emphasize, this is not really a market mechanism. It's somebody peddling, somebody with his hand on the saving. <laughs> it is, he perceives that the government, that, that the economy needs uh, lower interest rates, okay? And he, so here it goes. All right. But uh, when, that, when that's what happens, then you don't get a new market equilibrium. You get a double disequilibrium. Uh, what you get uh, is, let me go to the next one here. You get demanders, in other words, investors move along the demand curve. They want to borrow more because the interest rate's lower. But savers who haven't changed their saving preferences want to save less because they're not getting so much interest anymore. 
okay? And the difference, that horizontal distance, uh, is precisely the money created to make that curve shift. So, so you're padding the supply of loanable funds with money created for the purpose. But that money created for the, for the purpose has no counterpart in the real sector. In other words, they don't print bricks as well as money. They don't print resources. They can. They just print the money. And it doesn't give the economy more resources. It just causes them to misallocate the ones they've got. All right? All right, now all we have to do, you see, I've, I've paved the way for us with that first part showing you how markets work. It's pretty easy uh, to use the same apparatus to show you how markets go wrong when you've got an increase in the money supply driving down interest rates. Uh, if, uh, if you look at it from the investor's point of view, it looks to the investor as if the economy's got more saving, is moving along the PPF clockwise. But to the consumer, it looks like they're going the other way because they're not saving as much now because they're not getting as much interest, so they're consuming instead. So consumers are, are pulling in the other direction. There's a tug of war. I like to... In the bottom here, there's a wedge being driven between saving and investment. Up here, there's a tug of war between consumers and investors. Uh, and if you look at this uh, diagram up here, what you see is consumers are pushing up, and we're measuring consumption vertically. Investors are pushing to the right, we're measuring investment horizontally. Uh, and so the economy is headed to some, I call it a virtual equilibrium point. There it is out there. Wonder if it exists or not. Well, you can't get there. It's too far outside that PPF. Uh, the economy will try to move in that direction. Uh, the common vernacular, it's overheated economy. Okay. Uh, let's look now at the, at the structure of production to see what's going on. The market signal that comes from the consumer. No, I do the investor first. The market signal that the investor is looking at looks like uh, we need an elongation of that triangle, more long term projects, but there's not enough resources to complete that triangle. Okay? The consumer uh, is trying to consume more now because he can't get much for his saving. So we have what uh, John Cochran uh, at uh, Metropolitan State calls dueling triangles, okay? Here you got a wedge down here, here you got tug of war, there you got dueling triangles. It doesn't seem very healthy, does it? <laughs> it's not a gonna work out right for us, all right? Now, what we get then is a certain amount of overinvestment. That's just more investment that can be justified by the saving. What, uh, if, what Mises emphasized was the malinvestment. In other words, the pattern is wrong. Uh, you get too much in the early stages. At the same time, you get overconsumption, as we've gotten big time in this last uh, boom. Uh, and I'll measure that, uh, or label that also on the uh, Triangle. I could call it malconsumption, but it sounds like malnourishment or something. So overconsumption, right? Mises says down here, uh, use the phrase repeatedly, malinvestment and overconsumption. That's what characterizes uh, the business cycle. And there you can see it in the diagrams, malinvestment and overconsumption. Now, so what happens? Well, the tug of war pits consumers against investors pushes the economy beyond the frontier. I get some flack about that. You can't go beyond the frontier. Well, in macro terms, the frontier is characterized by what's called the natural rate of unemployment. In other words, in, in a, even a healthy economy, uh, you might have uh, 5% to 6% unemployment. People between jobs, uh, people just coming into the labor force and so on. Uh, the Austrians recognize that as well as anyone else. <clears throat> if when the economy is overheated, uh, the level of unemployment goes well below 
that five to six percent. Uh, Clinton had it down to four percent. Okay, and so uh, with unemployment that low, you can see on the PPF you're, you're pushing beyond uh, the PPF, but it's unsustainable. You see, the PPF shows you sustainable levels. It's unsustainable. It's circling to the right because of that interest rate bias. You have a low interest rate that favors investment, okay? But eventually, it's not going to work out for us, and the economy is going to turn down and possibly going to deep recession, all right? And so uh, that particular uh, line, if you look at orange line coming down, that's the only line that uh, Keynes saw. He thought the economy moved down along that orange line based on psychological factors and so on, animal spirits, fetish of liquidity, all the phrases are there in Keynes. And he didn't see the capital theoretic aspect of it uh, that Hayek pointed out. Okay, so again, uh, I've left off the labor market here. It gets uh, pretty complicated uh, with the business cycle. It sounds like a management course when I've got three P's here, but I, I, I succumb to helping you remember it. Padding the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Papering over the difference between saving and investment gives play to a tug of war between investors and consumers, or consumers and investors. Pitting early stage uh, against late stages distorts the Hayekian triangle in both directions. The temporal discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. That's the essence of the business cycle. We'll watch the economy respond to a credit expansion. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> <Boom and bust>. <laughs> <laughs> then here's here's Greenspan wondering what went wrong. You know, where, where, did, where did he miss it? You know, Bernanke is left to clean up the mess. Okay. That's Joe the plumber. I don't know if you're right now. What's, what's going on, folks? Can't you get it straight? <laughs> Again, look at the difference. It, here's, here's genuine growth. It's working right. Okay, that's what I actually figure out how it works right. And once you know that, uh, then of course you know it's not going to go right if you've got uh, credit. <laughs> That's my book, I'll, I'll just leave that there. Okay, thank you very much. Five minutes, yeah. yeah, we got about five minutes, we can take questions if uh, there be any. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Should we use saving uh, rather than the gross domestic product uh, to, to, as an indicator of growth? Uh, and, and I say yes, but we've got to be careful what saving figure we use because um, mainstream tends to use saving, claiming there's been a lot of it because they factor in appreciation on housing. <laughs> okay. If you've seen the uh, debate between Peter Schiff and Art Laffer, you get a full flavor of that, okay? So uh, when you look at saving, look at what's called saving out of income, okay? Saving out of income and not appreciation of housing, which is actually a byproduct of the, of the decrease in the interest rate. It drives up home prices and makes people uh, feel wealthier, even though after the bus they find out they're not. Okay, I, I like to look at uh, look at saving. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, 
I'll, I'll tell you this, if you look at uh, the Federal Reserve economic data at St. Louis, uh, a good place to find that uh, is when, when, when you pull up saving, they, pull, they have government saving too. This is another thing that you gotta watch out for. And I thought, well, I wanna see this. How much is government saving, you know? Does anybody know? <laughs> turns out it was a, really a euphemism. It turns out that the, you, you get deficits. In other words, oh yeah, it's all negative. <laughs> You're gone into debt, so you gotta watch that too, yes. Right. Okay. Can't uh, credit expansion encourage the creation of new resources? Uh, or uh, yeah, ex it certainly uh, is. It certainly uh, causes people to go out and look for more resources. But that's just part of the misallocation. The, the, the efforts in that direction are taken away from other efforts that would have been closer to consumption, okay? Now, uh, a, a similar claim is that it, uh, it causes increases in technology. You know, people in research and development, they, they discover how to do things they might not have discovered uh, had it not been for the cheap credit. And, uh, even people who might halfway recognize the Austrian critique say, well, but in net terms, it might be worthwhile. In fact, it kind of worries me that Ben Bernanke has taken that uh, point of view. Uh, and at one point, he even expressed it uh, poetically. He says, "'Tis better to have boomed and busted than never to have boomed at all." <laughs> Of course, Hayek would be here to say wrong. It's just wrong, you know, that uh, the boom and bust uh, represents a, a net loss. It's a discoordination that uh, amounts to a net loss. Yeah, let me, let me get her here and then I'll come back here. The cycles have preceded the, the Federal Reserve. So is there an analog to this argument that goes before central banking? Yeah, uh, there, there sure is. A book I recommend is a book by Dick Timberlake on the, uh, the history of the central banking in the in the U.S. and of course it in, it includes uh, uh, the first bank of the U.S. and the second bank of the U.S. Uh, and uh, even during the free banking era, so-called uh, manipulations and disruptions that that gave us distortions. But it's it's also significant that only after you had a full-fledged central bank did you get something as deep and long as the Great Depression, <laughs> okay? Uh, so the, the answer though is yes, there's always been interventions of one sort or another uh, in banking, but all the more so since we've had the Fed in, uh, created. One more question back here, yes. Uh -huh. Well, my, my, my qualm with that is, can, you know, can they spend their savings on consumption? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, I, in fact, even when I teach Keynesian theory, I don't claim that, you know, that it always equals, saving always equals investment. Uh, it's, uh, to, to get it to be always equal uh, requires some uh, accounting maneuvering uh, that I don't think I want to get into uh, today, but I may, I may discuss that in the lecture I give uh, tomorrow. But save, typically saving equally investment is an equilibrium condition, okay? It's, it's not always true that saving equal investment, but only when it is true is the economy in equilibrium. There are some textbooks that says it's always equal. Uh, those are bad textbooks in my judgment. <laughs> Oh, well, there it is. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.